Hi, I'm Whitney Espick, the CEO of the MIT Alumni Association, and I hope you enjoy this digital production created for alumni and friends like you. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining tonight's cocktail class at home. First and foremost, we hope everyone is staying safe. Um, I'm Ellie Leahy, Associate Director of MIT 10 Annual Giving, and I'm joined tonight by my colleague, Alyssa Holland, who I partner with in the MIT Alumni Association. For those of you who don't know, MIT 10 means the undergraduate alumni of the last decade, so all of you. We're really excited to bring this event to you tonight, and we're so pleased to see so many of you with us. A couple of housekeeping items. You'll see that you're in, I'm in speaker view right now. Uh, to get the most out of Jared's demo, we'll switch that over to Jared, and we encourage you to remain in that view throughout the entire event. You'll also see that your mic has been disabled. Please post any questions you have in the chat, and we'll do our, be do our best to get to them throughout the demonstration, as well as saving some time at the end for Jared to answer those. Now, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce Jared, a Course 6 2010 MIT alumnus turned bartender. Jared currently serves as general manager of the Hawthorne in Kenmore Square, and assistant bar director of Eastern Standard and the Hotel Commonwealth. Tonight, Jared will be sharing a bit of his expertise to help you all, myself included, upscale your cocktails in your own kitchen. So without further delay, Jared, take it away for us. Great, well, welcome everyone. Um, I hope everyone is, uh, hope everyone is safe uh, at home as well. Um, and thank you to the Alumni Association for uh, having me. This is like the, just the very tail end of my time as an MIT 10, so um, just in the nick of time. Um, cocktails are what we're here for, um, and I wanted to share a little bit about uh, what what I get to do professionally um, with with all of you. Who I mean, now that a lot of us are stuck at home, um, it's given us uh, a chance to uh, mix mix some new and, and creative creations. Uh, at home, whether we have the equipment to do it or not. Uh, so we're going to go through today um, a few different cocktails. These are all like I would call I would call them sort of like the the, the great classics, um, ones that I think are very versatile. Uh, that even if you don't have the exact ingredients for this particular drink at home, uh, you can use it as a template of sorts and come up with uh, your your own great drinks. Um, we'll be talking a little bit about tools as well, and a little bit about technique, um, and then happy to take uh, some questions um, at the end. There's a lot of familiar faces in here, so it's nice to see you all. Um, those of you who have joined us uh, in the past, uh, there is a live version um, of this, I suppose, over the independent activities period um, that uh, I've had the pleasure of, of hosting for the last eight years, so um, uh, it's good to see some of you back. So. I hope this isn't too much of a repeat material. So um, I unfortunately can't be at the Hawthorne, but I'm very lucky to have um, a, a pretty robust home bar set up um, for you all. And so we're going to talk about uh, cocktails, right? Because we want to make um, we want to make these mixed drinks and whatnot. Now the word cocktail has a bit of history to it. At, at one point in time, the the word cocktail meant uh, something a little bit more exact than what we would say today, in much the same way that, that we Xerox something or Google something or pull a Kleenex. Uh, the word cocktail has sort of uh, become this catch-all term for a number of mixed drinks. But if you roll back the clock about 200 years, you would have had cocktails among other drinks like slings and fizzes and flips and toddies and juleps and daisies and, and so on and so forth. Uh, so um, today we're going to be making um, some mixed drinks, uh, a sour, a daisy, um, a cocktail, and a variation on a, a classic cocktail uh, as well. Um, with mixed drinks and, and, and cocktails uh, in, in general today, what we think about a lot at the Hawthorne is this idea of balance. So we want our drinks to not just be like a, like a mix of three interesting ingredients, but they should fit together in a way that makes, it makes the total cocktail sort of taste more than just the sum of its parts, right? 
Um, so with a, a basic daiquiri, for example, which is the first drink that we're going to start with, um, you're looking at sort of three major points, right? Obviously, a great cocktail is going to have a great alcohol, right? Ethanol um, is what makes uh, uh, cocktails fun. Um, what what keeps us level sometimes, um, and uh, is sort of the backbone of a great drink. Um, we have to counter that alcohol with with something else, right? We can't just take shots all the time, right? So we're going to um, sort of balance something strong with something sweet, right? In this case, it's usually sugar, but sometimes you can use liqueurs. Um, or, or other sort of flavored syrups and whatnot. You can find a lot of, of really interesting products now, even in sort of your, your run-of-the-mill grocery store. Um, it's really taken off. And you can make a lot of these things at home um, with fresh fruits or um, other, other sorts of, of, of sweet ingredients. Um, and then we can't just have something strong and something sweet, right? You need to balance that sweetness with usually some acidity. And a popular choice with cocktails is uh, citrus juice. So lemon or uh, lime are, are, are very popular, but there's lots of other ways that you can incorporate acids into cocktails as well. And when you have those three points on this like triangle, I guess, sort of in balance, you're strong, sweet, and acidic, uh, you will have um, a, a drink that really comes together in, in an interesting way. A daiquiri uh, that's made well to me doesn't taste like uh, rum, and lime juice and sugar, but it, it tastes like uh, it tastes like a daiquiri, okay? Um, and so we're gonna put one together, but we have to do a little bit of prep work first to get ourselves there, right? Um, first and foremost, we need some uh, lime juice, right? Um, if you wanna up your cocktail making game at home, the, the number one thing you can do uh, is to use fresh citrus juice whenever you can. Um, I know that's sometimes a bit of a tall order, but what's contained inside these things is so much more vibrant and so much more interesting um, than what you might find in, um, say, a plastic bottle of something uh, at, your, at your local grocery store that, that, that maybe says lime juice, right? Um, fresh, fresh citrus, unfortunately, does not keep for very long um, at our bar. Um, at the Hawthorne, we use uh, fresh pressed citrus every single day, and at the end of that night, it is no longer um, it is no longer fresh enough for us to use the, the next day. So that can be a bit of a tall order um, at, at home. Now, whole limes and whole lemons, they'll, they'll last about a week or so in, in your fridge before they start to uh, sort of like shrivel up. Um, so that's kind of a good way to store them. And if you are really in a pinch, <laughs> The next best thing, and I can't believe that I'm actually like, I'm not showing you this product, I swear. Um, but there's this stuff called true lemon and true lime. This stuff is wild. It's literally just dehydrated um, fresh pressed lemon juice. And they put it in a powder form. They make them in like these small packets that are like little sugar packets. And uh, each packet is like the juice of half a lemon or a juice of a lime or whatnot. And you can mix it with, with water and you can get pretty close. Um, it's, I would probably say it's the next best thing. The, the plastic bottles of like shelf stable lemon and lime juice, those are chock full of uh, interesting preservatives and chemicals and some other adulterants that um, allow them to have that staying power. And unfortunately they sort of taste like a, um, a shell of what uh, it, 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 it's purporting itself to be, right? So fresh citrus is um, the name of the game. To get that citrus, that, that beautiful citrus juice out, right? You can use um, a citrus press. A lot of people have um, one of these at, at home now. You cut your citrus in half and you put it inside the press and then down it goes and you get beautiful juice. Um, if you don't have one of these, there's a different type of uh, device called a, a citrus reamer. This one has a little, a little like attachment at the bottom that can collect the juice for you. Um, they make KitchenAid attachments for their juicers. There's, there's all kinds of ways you can extract. Um, the juice. I did this in advance because I didn't think it was a, a good use of our time to watch me juice like 10 lines. So I, I, I did some fresh pressed juice um, that I have in this little bottle here. Um, I suppose I'm going to drink a lot of daiquiris over the next day um, so that I don't waste any, right? Um, the next ingredient is that, that sweetening agent, right? Um, sugar, and I have a lot of it here. We're not going to use all of this tonight, I hope. Um, 
sugar does, sugar and, and, and alcohol doesn't really mix very well. It doesn't like to dissolve um, in alcohol very readily. It will, but it, it takes some effort. And so the way that we incorporate uh, sugar into our cocktails is uh, using uh, a simple syrup. So um, commonly it is a one-to-one -one mix of sugar and water. Um, you can be a nerd, and I know that most of you are, and you can do it by, uh, you can do it using a scale and do it by mass. Um, but you can actually get pr pretty close um, if you just use uh, a volumetric measure. And one sort of theme that we do at the Hawthorne um, is we, we try to make our cocktails as consistently as possible. And you'll, you'll hear me talk about that um, a few other times throughout the hour that we have together. Um, but what I'm doing is I'm adding, um, just a half cup of sugar, so four ounces um, of sugar. <clears throat> I'm gonna sugar. I got this salad dressing like mixer thing from my mom when I left for MIT in 2006. Um, and this is a great thing to mix like syrups and stuff in. Um, because I'm gonna put a, a half cup of water, so four cups of water, or sorry, four ounces of water in with that sugar. Now, if you have some space and a little bit of time, you can put this whole thing on, you can put the sugar and water in a pot and put it on the stove and you can heat it up. You don't wanna boil it, but you can heat it up and uh, when, it's, when it's hot, uh, the sugar will dissolve a little bit more readily. Um, this salad dressing thing has this like little mixing knob on it, which is hilarious and um, doesn't really make it useful for very many things, but uh, for, mixing sugar syrup, uh, it does uh, pretty well. So we'll let that kind of like cook and dissolve. And because I'm not heating this up, this is gonna take just a minute to, um, it's just gonna take a minute to dissolve. So we'll just let that kind of rise there. Now, we wanna make a daiquiri, okay? A daiquiri is a combination of rum. Uh, today we're gonna be using a, a white rum, but you can really use any rum. Uh, lime juice and uh, sugar. Right, just a really simple combination. A lot of people have had daiquiris before, um, and they, when you say the word daiquiri, they think perhaps uh, of a cruise ship, they think perhaps of something that's coming out of a frozen drink machine, something that might be bright pink or bright blue or bright green, um, can have any number of different uh, fruit flavors. Um, and those are all variations on this, like this very classic cocktail, right? We're talking about the early 1900s in uh, the, the country of Cuba. There, the, the legend goes that there was a, a British mining engineer uh, by the name of Jennings Cox, who was entertaining some folks over at his residence um, just outside of the town uh, of Daiquiri. And uh, as most British would do, they were, he was entertaining with gin martinis, which is just such a wonderful thing to drink on the island of Cuba. <clears throat> but unfortunately, he ran out of gin, which is a terrible thing to have right before your party. So looking around, he didn't want to use the local rum to make martinis. It seemed weird. It didn't taste right. But he said, what else can I mix with this, right? No, oh, there's local limes, beautiful local limes that, that, that grow there. And, um, obviously, there's a, a good amount of sugar here just to balance out that acidity. So he mixed those things. And so we're told the daiquiri was born. Now, the funny thing about drinking history is that um, it's usually pretty hazy, right? No one's writing the stuff down in the corner at your party or whatnot, recording down what's happening. So we don't know the origins of a lot of these drinks. But that is a, um, a pretty logical answer. Um, to how this combination of ingredients might uh, come about. So when we mix our daiquiri, because we're using citrus juice and uh, like a simple syrup, which has a lot of, a lot of viscosity and you know, sugar and whatnot, um, simply just mixing them together in, in your glass and then trying to drink it, it's not going to be sort of fully, uh, fully homogenized um, or, or every, everything will be kind of separated and it'll taste like it'll be a sweet little burst or a bit of citrus here and then a, a wallop of rum. Um, so we want to really aggressively mix these ingredients together. And so we're going to use a shaker. Now a shaker can look um, any number of different ways. So this is one shaker, it's called a cobbler. Some of you I, I, I can see have, have these here. So it's a three piece little job. It has a little filter right on the top. 
and you open it up and you put your ingredients in and you close it and you shake it up, right? Um, at our bar, we use a, a two-piece shaker, two metal tins, which fit together pretty neatly. We use uh, this over the cobbler because it's one less piece to wash and one less piece to lose, really. Um, and this works really well. Um, also, this is known as a Boston shaker, actually. Um, we don't really know why, um, but two tins there. Um, or you can use any number of other things, right? One of my favorite tricks that I have at home is just use a, use a mason jar with a, with a lid that, that fits tight. You can put everything in, you can seal it up, and you can just give that a whirl, and it's going to be great, too. Um, another great one uh, are Nanjing balls. These can hold, like, you can make, like, four cocktails in one of these, which is really great, too. So lots of different options. Um, we're going to uh, we're gonna use the cobbler shaker um, to start. And we're going to measure our ingredients, right? We measure with these tools. They're called jiggers. They're like highly specialized bar tools. You don't really see them used in anything else. Um, a, a jigger usually has two sides, two conical sides. Um, one side will usually be twice the volume of the other side, but that's not always the case. Mine has measurements like etched into it, which is helpful if you ever forget. Um, but if you don't have them at home, that's okay too. Um, a lot of folks have these little um, OXO measuring cups in a variety of sizes. This is a metal one that looks pretty great. Um, you saw me using uh, like a, a half cup measure, which is two ounces, um, or sorry, a quarter cup measure is two ounces, um, or you can use a tablespoon, um, which is about a half an ounce. Um, and so there's any number of ways you can measure this stuff out too, right? So um, you don't have to necessarily have exactly the right tools to really make a great drink. Just has to get you there in an accurate and consistent way. So we'll start with um, we'll start with white rum. We're going to measure two ounces of white rum um, into our shaking device. Um, I'm using a really beautiful blended white rum uh, called Profitas. Um, it's a mix of Barbados and Jamaica rums. So it's nice and rich and full-bodied, um, but it um, uh, has just a little bit of extra kind of funky complexity to it, which I really like um, in the drink. And this, I just got this actually almost, almost all the way dissolved, right? My next ingredient is going to be uh, that fresh squeezed lime juice. So after my two ounces of rum, I'm going to measure three quarters of an ounce of fresh squeezed lime juice or whatever lime juice you happen to have. If you want to get really weird, there's actually some, you can look it up online. You can, um, you can just use a combination of citric and malic acid to mimic um, a, lot of, a lot of popular citrus juices. And you can just make these acids that are essentially shelf stable forever. Um, they don't have the same texture as fresh lime or fresh lemon would, but in a pinch, they actually work really well. I mean, a lot of bars are starting to catch on to that too. It's a little bit more eco-friendly. Um, to transport a big bag of citric acid than it is to uh, uh, transport several cases of limes. Um, so we have two ounces of rum, three quarters of an ounce of uh, fresh lime juice, and then three quarters of an ounce of our simple syrup. So I'm going to let's see, well, pretty much all the way dissolved actually, which is kind of cool. Um, I'll measure three quarters of an ounce there. And this two ounce, three quarter, three quarter is a, a pretty common ratio that uh, you're going to find uh, in, a, in, in a lot of classic drinks. And in much the same way uh, with this daiquiri recipe, for example, if you don't have white rum, but you have gin, then you can make a drink that's called a gimlet um, in exactly the same way. You're just substituting it out, right? Uh, if you have whiskey, uh, you make a whiskey sour. Uh, usually we would use lemon juice instead of lime. Um, lemon juice uh, and whiskey play better together. They, they taste better together than lime does. Um, you can do, you can use it, use vodka, you use all sorts of different kinds of rum, you use tequila. Um, it, it all works, but um, that ratio is a pretty common one, right? Two ounces of something strong, a three-quarter ounce measure of something acidic, and a three-quarter ounce measure of something sweet. The Acidity and the sweetness sort of balance each other out pretty well, as long as you're using a, a one-to-one -one ratio of simple syrup. Um, and then you need a little bit more of, of that, of that uh, ethanol, right? When you think about it, um, 
you know, this rum is 47% alcohol by volume. So I might be using much more volume of the rum itself, but it's actually very close almost the, the amount of actual ethanol that you're, you're using to balance that acidity and the sugar, right? So we're gonna get a glass out. Uh, a lot of people care a lot about the glass that their drink goes in. And uh, it's hard for me to say this because at, at, at the Hawthorne, we also uh, adhere to that. And we have very light, elegant glassware that we use for particular reasons. But if you're drinking at home, um, it doesn't matter. You can put the drink in whatever you got. Uh, coffee cups are great, um, especially if you're on Zoom calls uh, with like your work or whatever, meetings and things. Um, <clears throat> and have your coffee cup of daiquiri. Um, I like to use uh, a coupe glass, uh, one because I have them at home and I don't really use them for anything else. So these are uh, a, a pretty handy and elegant way to drink this daiquiri. You could serve it on the rocks in a low ball, you could put it in a wine glass, whatever you got, right? So I'm gonna put ice cubes in my uh, fizzy tank. You really don't want to skimp here. I filled this thing all the way up with, with, with ice. Um, and we shake with ice for a few reasons. One, obviously we want this thing to get cold. It tastes better when it's cold, at least the, our, our present palates today um, tell us that. Um, and we also want some dilution to occur too. And uh, dilution is important. Uh, in many cocktails that you'll get at like your fancy cocktail bars around town or just any bar really about a quarter to a third of that drink is going to be water and water is another agent that will balance this whole equation out right um, we also shake because we want those ice cubes to really move around um, in the the shaker tin and that will um, that will aerate the 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 liquid that's in there so the ice cubes will start to break up um, those little shards will be flying around and they'll help incorporate some some air into this drink and if you shake hard enough and for just the right amount of time um, when you pour this cocktail out it will be almost as if it were fizzy um, so much so that you could hold it up to your ear and you'd actually hear it kind of fizzing that fizzing is what like brings some of these aromatics up out of the glass so that as you bring like a very fresh cocktail up to your nose you'll smell it um, it'll be much more aromatically interesting than um, if you just mix them together in the glass and just sort of giving it a stir, right? Um, so we're going to shake this up um, together uh, if, if, if you've been mixing along with me. And if not, uh, I'll post the recipe later and, and you can make them yourself. So we're going to shake hard with ice for about 15 to 20 seconds. Now, if you've got ice like mine, I use these like pink cube trays. So you get these nice kind of hard, like dense ice cubes. They look nice. These are easy. They're super cheap. You get them at Target. Um, if you have ice cubes that come out of your like fancy refrigerator that makes them yourselves, uh, that, that, that makes them itself, or you have a bag of party ice or whatnot, that ice is going to be a little different. Um, if your ice is small chunks, if it's particularly like wet or melty, um, you won't need to shake for as long because it'll over dilute your cocktail. But um, ice like this, which is a little bit harder and denser, um, just out of the freezer, um, we're going to shake for about 15 to 20 seconds or so. And it's about shaking, not as fast as you can, but as hard as you can. You want the ice to really start to break up, right? So uh, we'll go ahead and do that. And you can hear that like the ice is following this like kind of rhythm, right? It's like hitting both ends of that, of that cobbler shaker um, with a good amount of force. Uh, it's about having rhythm. I know that um, it took me a while. I didn't really have much when I got to MIT and it, 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 uh, I feel like that was a shared pain with a lot of us um, in that class. But um, once you figure out your own rhythm, it depends on how your body is structured, your elbows, arms, length, and, and how you hold the tin. Um, and you can develop that to really just get the, um, the ice to hit both ends of the shaker tin as hard as possible. You see there's like a, it's kind of hard to see in the video, but there's like a nice layer of frost that develops on here. This thing is like, this thing is really cold, 
really nice and well chilled and aerated. I'll take the cap off. And then we just, um, with if you have a cobbler strainer like this, you can just strain straight out into your glass. If you don't have a cobbler strainer or a, a cobbler shaker, there's a few other options that you have at your disposal. So the classic tool is called a Hawthorne strainer. This will fit over a variety of uh, tins and glassware and whatnot to let you strain as well. It has a spring that kind of lets stuff through. If you don't have one of those, um, lots of other options. Uh, this is um, a paddle that came with my rice cooker. That is a great way for holding ice back as you strain out. Um, if you have uh, something like your mason jar, just that sort of inner lid itself, you can just pull that up slightly and you can let all of that, that great liquid out. I've seen people use other spoons. Um, a chef's knife is a, a much more dangerous, but just uh, equally fun way um, to strain your cocktail as well. Um, lots of different ways you can do that. In this, in this case, we don't really want the ice um, to be in this drink. We just want that beautiful liquid there. And you can see it's like almost completely opaque. Um, it's all the same color, very uniform. Everything's mixed together. Um, a nice mix of rum, lime, and sugar. We have our daiquiri here. Cheers. We've got a drink in front of you now. Um, <clears throat> glad we're doing this in the evening. But if it happened to be like one o'clock in the afternoon, it wouldn't matter either. So, cool. Yum. That's delicious. Now, some of you may have made this with gin, some of you may have a whiskey, um, any number of ways um, you can spin it. That combination just works really, really well. Now, a variation uh, on that drink. So I'm going to see if I can, uh, let's see if I can show you this. Uh, so here is, um, <clears throat> here's that recipe for a daiquiri, right? Um, two ounces of white rum, three quarters of an ounce of lime juice, and three quarters of an ounce of simple syrup, right? So what if, let's say, simple syrup sounds boring, right? Sugar is not that that interesting to me. I want to use something like way more fun than that. Um, let's use a liqueur, right? A sweet liqueur, uh, like an orange liqueur, for example. So in this case, we have like something like Grand Marnier, um, orange curacao. Um, you can use a product like Cointreau. Um, a popular style of orange liqueur is called triple sec. Um, those are um, pretty pretty generic. You can find them in just about every liquor store. It's the key ingredient um, <clears throat> to both sweeten, strengthen, and offer some acidity uh, to a really great class of cocktails known as a daisy. So in this case, we have a drink called a margarita. It's probably the best known daisy um, out there. And for those of you who are Spanish speakers, um, there's like 20 or 30 different ways that the, the word daisy, or the, 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 that we think uh, the, the margarita came from, right? There's all these stories of people in um, exotic places mixing really cool drinks and coming up with this cocktail they call the margarita. And there were a few people that were named margarita uh, that claim that they invented this drink. But um, the, if you just look at the type of drink it is, it's a daisy. And the Spanish word for daisy is margarita so that's probably the answer we're looking for we think so uh we're gonna make a quick little margarita uh, if you want to follow along you can um but it, it wasn't really part of it but i figured hey i should have another drink right um in this case i'm just gonna use the mason jar just so you can see how that might look um we're gonna use two ounces of tequila so same ratio right something strong in this case we have uh, tequila Beautiful Fortaleza Blanco, uh, great 100% agave tequila from the heartland of uh, the tequila making region, literally the town of tequila itself. I'm going to do that same three quarters of an ounce of lime juice. And I'm going to use three quarters of an ounce of an orange liqueur. In this case, we're using Grand Marnier. This is a mix of uh, 
like an it's an orange infused liqueur that's mixed with a blended with a little bit of cognac. Um, really beautiful spirit and um, adds just an extra layer of, of complexity to these drinks. Um, and if you think about it too, the Grand Marnier is 40% ABV. So whereas our, our simple syrup has no alcohol in it at all, this is 40%. So we're in fact um, increasing the amount of alcohol in this drink by a, a considerable amount. So some would say that makes it more fun, but you know, you, uh, each of them. So I'm going to put ice in this. And again, I'm really just going to like fill this up. I, I just want there to be a good amount. Of, yeah. I'm going to get another glass. I like to have my margaritas up. I know a lot of people like them on the rocks. I'm going to cap my mason jar. And then same thing. It makes like a much less pleasant sound, so um, I'm sorry about that, but it's working pretty well. That is like a really weird sound. It is a really strange sound. Um, so again, I'm gonna uncap that, and then I'm just gonna take that little sort of like inner lid out, and I'm just gonna move it just forward like a little bit. See how there's like a gap now? And then I can just like, I can just strain the margarita right into this coop. You can buy fancy bar tools if, if, if you want. There's a lot of places online that sell them now. Um, some of them are cheap. Some of them are very expensive uh, for no real reason at all. Um, but again, it, as long as you can execute a, a great cocktail, right? Measuring consistently, using good ingredients, and shaking hard then it really doesn't make too much of a difference, right? So we have a margarita. And when you taste this, an exercise we often do is putting them next to a daiquiri and people say, wow, it's not as sweet. Uh, it's much stronger. It tastes more acidic, right? And you can imagine that the substitution of that orange liqueur um, makes a pretty big difference there. Um, now, you can adjust that recipe, right? You have control is the cocktails that you're making for yourself at, at home. So if you think it's too acidic, you could cut the amount of lime juice you're using back a bit. If you think it's too, if it's not sweet enough, you can add a little bit of simple syrup or agave nectar or something else um, to that. Or you can even, um, heaven forbid, dial back the amount of tequila you're using um, uh, and, and sort of tone the, the strength of this drink down slightly, right? I think that's pretty darn good. Okay, so we're gonna go back now. And right back into it. Great, so those are two sort of really classic examples of a shaken cocktail and what we're going to jump into next is a different style of drink entirely. So we're going to make a, a type of cocktail um, that a long time ago would have just been called a cocktail. Um, there were, as I said, a lot of different styles of drinks being made by very inventive bartenders. Um, not too dissimilar on what's happening in, in today's world over the last 10 years or so. Um, and these bartenders were taking all these different drinks and making sort of like weird, uh, they'd add a little bit of this or a twist of that, or they put it in a, uh, put it in a fancy, um, fancy glass, um, doing all sorts of stuff, right? And, you know, say like you walked into this bar and you kind of thought to yourself like, man, you know, I really just want a cocktail, which was a sugar, spirit, water, and bitters. Right, water, they didn't have ice in the early 1800s as readily available as we do now. So I want a cocktail, but fancy bartender with suspenders and a mustache and whatever else, um, I don't want one of your fancy cocktails. I want a cocktail done the old fashioned way, right? Um, so we have a drink called the old fashioned, which is really um, at its core, um, what we would refer to as a, as a whiskey cocktail, right? Um, 
So the old fashioned is not a shaken drink, it's actually stirred. Um, we stir with a number of different implements. You can stir with a very fancy mixing glass uh, that I have here. These are lovely. They look really pretty. So that's why I like them. Um, you can stir um, in your mason jar if you want. You can stir in your Nalgene. You can see where this is going, right? If it can hold liquid, you can probably stir um, your cocktail there. Now, why would we shake some things and stir some other things? Right. Um, with the shaken cocktails, you're using citrus juice, you're using heavy syrup, you're using things that don't want to mix all that well together. And so you need a very aggressive um, sort of movement to get everything to um, come together. With stirring, you can be a little bit more subtle. Uh, in the case of the old fashioned, we're going to use bitters. We're going to use just a, a small amount of sugar, just enough to, to sweeten the drink enough to, to enjoy. Um, and uh, just really beautiful whiskey. And so you don't actually need to shake that to get it all to mix together. Just by drawing the, the ice around in the glass, it's all going to come together really nicely. And so in general, cocktails that we make that are mostly uh, spirits, so a martini, say gin and vermouth, or a Manhattan is whiskey and vermouth, and a Negroni is gin, Campari, and vermouth, um, you can stir those and it'll mix together just fine. Um, it also has the benefit of maintaining the texture of the ingredients that you're putting in. So if you have a really beautiful whiskey um, that you're mixing into this Manhattan, um, you're not aerating it and forcing a bunch of like oxygen bubbles in there um, that will change the texture of that drink when it hits your, your palate when you take a sip. So this keeps everything very smooth and velvety and luxurious, I guess would be the, a, a term that gets thrown around a lot. Um, and so we try to do that when, when we can. Now stirring takes a little bit longer than shaking. Um, so, uh, cause it's a less efficient process, right? And so much so that if you wanted, in lieu of stirring, you could put all of your ingredients into your uh, drinking vessel. You could add a little bit of ice kind of like kick it around for like a second and then just walk away. You just walk away and then come back like 10 minutes later and the drink will be perfect. So if you're feeling like exceptionally lazy, you can do that. If you're even lazier like I am, I just made a, a giant bottle of uh, a pre-batched uh, Negroni cocktail and I just put it in the freezer. So then if I ever want a Negroni, I don't have to make one. I just get a glass with ice and I pour up and then I leave and I come back to it and it's done. It's awesome, right? So let's make this old fashioned. We're gonna make the old fashioned um, starting with aromatic bitters. <clears throat> a lot of you um, have probably seen this stuff before. Angostura bitters, these are like kind of the oldest, original, uh, most, most well-known uh, bitters brand, partly because of, uh, so they say, um, a, a, mis a misprint of their label. Uh, that they just went with anyways because they had no other option and it became uh, such an iconic part of their brand that they do it on purpose now. Um, <clears throat> these bitters you can get just about anywhere. They have them in the grocery store. Um, the thing that most people don't realize is that these bitters are 40, almost 45% alcohol by volume. These bitters are exceptionally intense in, in infusions of herbs and spices and barks and other things like that. Um, that uh, are done in like a, in, in, in a high proof, in a high proof liquor. Um, and so you use them in very small amounts. You can think of them like um, spices, like salt and pepper in cooking. It's not necessarily always enough for you to taste exactly what you're using there, but it helps other flavors come together. And in the case of this, it, it really does, it, it works wonders on, on, on the whiskey itself. So. Um, we use, um, I like to use at home, these little dropper bottles. You can buy these at like the like apothecary shops and cocktail supply places and whatnot. Um, we do this because it's a little more consistent. Every time I squeeze this, um, it takes up about the same amount of bitters every time. Whereas with these bottles, you have this little like thing on the top that you kind of like dash out, right? And depending on how full the bottle is, um, one of you guys can probably like model this uh, better than I can explain it. Um, <clears throat> but different amounts will come out depending on how full the bottle is. As you never actually know. Um, so we like consistency. 
So I'm going to put um, I'm going to put three dashes of Angostura bitters. And I said three dashes, not not three drops, right? So it's like three full squeezes of this little guy. Or if you have one of these, it's just like a one, two, three. A um, little bit of bitters there. And if you have the bitters with you, give them a smell. There's just this Angostura is beautiful, like baking spice, um, uh, chin, chinchona bark. It's a heavy dose of like cinnamon, nutmeg, allspice, cloves. Um, really, really tasty. Um, to really appreciate it, you can put a little bit on your hands and just rub them together and smell, and it'll just be um, just it's just incredibly fragrant stuff. Um, it's it's really great. Um, I don't recommend drinking this on its own. Uh, it's a little intense. Um, some bartenders use it as like a tough guy shot, but I, I generally don't don't recommend it. Now, because these are intensely bitter, right? And we're going to be putting some um, some like high strength whiskey with it. We need a little bit of sugar um, to uh, balance that out. In this case, I'm really I, I'm only going to put um, a quarter ounce of sugar into my old fashioned. Um, some folks like theirs a little sweeter, and you can add a little bit more sugar. That's fine, too. Um, some places, like if you went to the Hawthorne, we use actual sugar cubes, and we muddle that into a paste. Um, it just gives a slightly different texture, but there's any number of ways that you can um, you can do that, right? And then we're going to use uh, rye whiskey. So um, this works with any sort of whiskey. Um, classically, this drink would have uh, called for rye. Um, a lot of uh, rye whiskeys tend to have a slightly spicier um, uh, taste and flavor profile, whereas uh, we often think of bourbon as being a little bit mellower and sweeter um, than rye. So in this case, you're taking rye whiskey and you're dressing it up with a little bit of sugar and some aromatics. Um, so that sort of like helps kind of tone it down and um, bring it uh, bring it all into uh, uh, into focus, right? Now, but if you enjoy bourbon, you can make it with bourbon too, or scotch whiskey, or um, cognac, or um, dark rum, or aged tequila, or literally whatever you want. This formula works really, really well. Um, and lots of room for experimentation. There's um, hundreds of different bitters companies that are out there making some very interesting uh, bittering agents. Um, so you can um, try a few, and you'll find that some work better in some spirits. Um, and, and others will work better uh, with, with, with others. So it's a nice way to experiment. So I'm going to add two ounces of rye whiskey. I'm using Wild Turkey 101. I really enjoy this rye. It is robust. It is one oh, the name 101 is because it is 101 proof or 50 and a half percent um, by uh, alcohol by volume. So it has a little bit more punch to it. Um, really enjoy drinking this stuff. Um, several generations now uh, have been uh, putting this really beautiful spirit together. And so you see I have uh, my um, whiskey, bitters, sugar. Now I just need that last piece for the cocktail, which is water. And since I have the luxury in 2020 of using ice that I made myself, we're going to do that. Notice that I'm not being like, I'm not really being shy about the amount of ice that I put into that, right? I've gone like way above the level of the glass, but as I stir this around, having that amount of ice in there is going to help keep everything centered and spinning very freely. Um, those of you who have taken a cocktail class with me before know that I always say that this is one of the hardest motions to master. And you'll see that I have this long handled bar spoon that has a twisted um, handle. And this lets it actually rotate in my hand very smoothly and very easily. I'm not physically spinning the spoon. The spoon is turning on its own. I'm just kind of, I'm just kind of keeping it centered and sort of guiding it, right? Um, when I was first learning, um, a tool that I used a lot when I was making drinks at home was a chopstick, um, which does not need to spin. You can just, just as easily draw this around like that. Yeah, someone said like milkshake spoons. Yeah, because they have the long handle, right? You can reach all the way down to the bottom of your milkshake. Um, 
So chopsticks uh, are not all, not just for eating. You can you can use them to make drinks. Um, they work really well. You can't really stir very effectively with like your normal like dinner spoon because it's usually the handle is flat and it won't rotate very well at, at all. And it, it'll end up just making a mess or worse, it'll break the glass you're, you're stirring in. So we're stirring that around while we're letting this come together. It's diluting, it's chilling. I'm gonna get my glass out. <coughs> If you can chill your glassware, that's like a really cool thing. It helps your cocktail stay cold for longer. Um, I'm also going to use, um, I have a nice large cube of ice. So the same company, that company Tavolo, that makes those square cube trays, they also make these giant ones. Um, and so you can have a, a piece of ice that just fits in your glass like that, which is pretty cool. So we're stirring. And notice that when I, when I shook, it was only 15 seconds-ish or so of hard shaking. But in the case of stirring, I'm, I'm going to stir for about a minute total, um, give or take. And as you can see, the amount of ice that I put in uh, is now just about right up at the top of that, that, that uh, I mean, what we can refer to as the wash line or where the liquid of the cocktail is coming up. Right? So we're almost there. <clears throat> Common question that we have is like, you know, well, how do you know when the drink is done, right? And so for a lot of us that have done this, right, like uh, 10, 20,000 times over, um, you sort of just know. Um, when I was starting out, it was a lot of just counting. I would just, I wanted to make the drink the same way every time. So I'd put the same amount of ice in, same recipe, and then I would stir it um, 120 rotations or whatever, um, which becomes very cumbersome when you're counting to 120 that many times in a night. And eventually you just sort of get a feel for it and you kind of can see how much it's diluted. You can sort of tell how, how cold it is um, and you go from there. So again, same thing. You have like an opening and you need to keep the ice from going into your glass. So you can use any number of those straining methods uh, that you want. Um, I have uh, this modified version of a Hawthorne strainer that actually fits inside this uh, mixing vessel here. and you can hold that in place and then I'm just going to strain this uh, really beautiful old fashion over. You see it's, it's still clear. I can still see through it. It retains that sort of velvety texture. It's a little bit richer from the, um, from the sugar syrup that I put in there. Um, and I have this really lovely old fashioned cocktail. Now, <clears throat> If we dialed the clock all the way back and just were, wanted to make a whiskey cocktail, we would have made um, this drink without ice. Instead, we would have uh, blended a little bit of water in with it and just gave it a stir. And that's how folks would, would drink that. Um, cocktails um, in, in their sort of beginnings um, were a drink you would have in the morning. It would, um, so to speak, like, it would cock your tail up. It would it would wake you up um, because presumably, because um, there wasn't as much to do uh, in the early 1800s, um, you spent the previous night um, also drinking, and so you w would wake up the next morning not feeling that great. So you'd have a cocktail to sort of like it's like that hair of the dog thing, right? You like kind of wake yourself back up and go, oh, ah, okay, here here we go. So uh, then that sets you up for. Um, I suppose what they thought at the time was like a whole day of success um, after waking up and having a whiskey cocktail. So in this case, we have the luxury of putting ice in it, which is great. And you can smell <clears throat> rye whiskey, that beautiful kind of caramel, vanilla, orange notes. Um, the bitters are playing through as well. Take a sip, lovely, right? It's just a, a great, you take a great spirit and you just lightly dress it up and it turns into something quite amazing. Now. They wouldn't have done this in the early 1800s, but we get to do it now. This needs to us, it needs a little bit of acidity, but I don't want to mess this up by adding, um, say, like citrus juice to it, because um, that'll make it cloudy. I'd probably shake it then. It just wouldn't mix well, it wouldn't taste right. Um, but we know that these um, citrus fruits have really beautiful uh, oil that's locked away in their, in their peel. So I'm gonna take a Y peeler. I highly recommend these over um, your standard like vegetable peeler. 
Um, they are both more than capable of taking um, bits of your finger off, but I find these a lot easier to control, um, not just for fruit, but also for like peeling veggies and whatnot. Um, and I'm just gonna take it, I'm holding it in one place here and I'm rotating the fruit below. And I'm gonna take a nice wide peel of this fruit. And I have this here, right? So hard to see obviously on Zoom, but um, there's all these little tiny pores um, on the exterior of that uh, of that lemon peel that I have. And on the inside is this white pith. Uh, the white pith is bitter, doesn't taste very good, it's kind of gross. If you leave it in your drink for too long, it'll make the drink a little bitter, which is unpleasant. Um, but, the, but the outside is this really fragrant, you can almost smell it already, really fragrant oil. Um, but we need the pith, the pith gives us a little bit of structure. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna hold this peel in between my thumb and my middle finger with the exterior of the peel facing out. And I'm just going to um, express, I'm gonna just pinch the twist, I'm gonna pinch this peel and express the oils from that lemon all over the top of this old fashioned. I'm gonna take a couple tries. And you can see if you look at that peel, I don't know why I'm doing this, you can't even see it in the video, but it is, um, it is now wet. And when you smell it, it is just extremely fragrant lemon, right? And it's all over your fingers too now, right? So we're not done with this yet. We're gonna, so we're gonna take this in our cocktail and we're actually just gonna take this wet peel. We're gonna use it a little bit longer. We're just gonna wipe one quick round on the outside of our glass. Uh, and then if you were having a, a drink at the Hawthorne where we're, we are jerks there and we take the peel and we do this down the side um, and then the peel can go in the drink or you can toss it, whatever you want. Um, we hope that you don't stick with this old fashioned for so long that the pith will turn your drink bitter, which will take maybe like say an hour or so. Um, so we feel comfortable putting it in. Now, when I serve that drink to you, what are you gonna do, right? You're gonna pick it up, you're gonna bring it up to your nose, and now instead of just the whiskey and spice, you get all of that, but just this overwhelming sort of like pop of, of, of acidic lemon, really beautiful. And we'll take a sip. That's delicious. And I have like a little bit of that lemon oil that was on the rim of the glass. That's now sort of interacting there. I and mean, that's really cool. I'm gonna put the drink down, have my conversation with whoever I'm with, whatnot. You, um, you know, scratch your nose or do something and that oil is all over your hands now too because it was on the side of the drink. So now this experience of having this cocktail has now sort of taken us even farther out than just the liquid that's in this glass, right? Um, and a really, really fantastic drink um, as well. So I'll, um, I'll put the uh, recipe up so that you can see it. Again, it's like pretty cut and dry. It's pretty straightforward. Um, and some folks uh, like their old fashions with um, some added acidity and sweetness from a muddled uh, orange and uh, maraschino cherry. That's a great way to enjoy an old fashioned as well. Um, definitely a bit more of a modern in invention, um, but certainly valid. Um, if you go to Wisconsin, I don't know if there's anyone from Wisconsin here currently, but uh, if you order an old fashioned in Wisconsin, it's usually made with brandy um, and uh, has uh, any number of other things put on top of it, like uh, seven up or uh, club soda or um, grapefruit soda. Uh, there's all sorts of different ways to, to do it there. Um, and again, same thing. If you don't like that sharp bite of uh, lemon oil, right? You can use something a little softer like orange. Um, grapefruit peel is really interesting um, and actually plays surprisingly well with, with whiskey. Um, so there's lots of different ways that, that you can kind of go um, with that, right? Uh, we are running out of time and I wanna make sure to, to respect that. Uh, one just really quick, a different drink that you can make with that whiskey that you might have at home. If you have some vermouth, you can make a Manhattan, right? So this was an evolution of um, the very, very simple old fashioned cocktail that was just whiskey lightly dressed up. In this case, now we're introducing another player to that stage, right? A sweet vermouth, a really nice uh, fortified and infused wine. Um, so it is wine, keep it in your fridge and try to use it uh, within a week or two. Um, mixed with bitters. And so that's just a, a, a sort of different way to experience that, uh, that really lovely whiskey uh, that you've had, right? Um, so 
I know that I, I can't read the chat completely, but I did see some questions kind of popping in there. And I just want to give some time if there was anything um, that I can answer uh, before we uh, sign off and we all can get back to your uh, evening activities, drinking or otherwise. Cleaning. What about cleaning? Is, is a rinse sufficient or do I need to use soap? Um, if you're making like lots of cocktails, right, all like all in a row, um, you, you don't really have to like soap and water every single time, right? When we make drinks at our bar, um, you know, we're not handling what's inside here. We're holding our bottles um, away from where they're pouring from, we're, 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 you know, from here. So things aren't necessarily being contaminated in that way. Um, but if you think about, um, if you think about, uh, uh, if you made a drink that has a very strongly flavored ingredient in it, and then you tried to make something that was much more delicate afterwards, you would want to rinse that out, right? So we often will just do a quick water rinse to just make sure it is um, uh, just without any of the prior ingredients in there, um, and then uh, we can sort of uh, we can sort of carry carry on, right? Uh, let's see how I develop my home bar. Um, if you are a professional bartender, um, one thing that will happen is uh, you'll just accumulate liquor um, at a pace that's usually faster than you can consume it yourself. Um, a common question that I think bartenders get all the time or a common comment um, is, uh, you know, they'll say, oh my God, like you must make the most amazing drinks at, at home and you must drink so well at home. And that's not, that's not true at all. We usually, um, it's like you get home from work and it's like rum in a cup. And sometimes there isn't a cup. Um, so it, it's, it, and sometimes you don't wanna have anything to drink at all, actually. So, um, you know, so this stuff kind of builds up. So thankfully, Ikea has really lovely shelving. Thank you, Ikea. Um, and really lovely lighting. Thank you, Ikea. Um, and so I can sort of put everything up and display it well. So um, someone said, uh, oh yeah, the Worcestershire sauce thing. So I realized that some people might not have Angostura bitters and in a real pinch, uh, Worcestershire sauce actually can serve the same purpose. You really don't want to overdo it with that or else your cocktail will just taste like Worcestershire sauce, but like a single dash in an old fashioned um, will help sort of give it a little extra complexity um, uh, to that drink in, in, in much the same way um, as uh, the bitters would, right? Um, and in, in fact, the Worcestershire sauce has a spice blend that it, it is actually fairly reminiscent of, of what is in Angostura bitter. The problem with Worcestershire sauce is that there's a bunch of other ingredients. There's soy sauce, anchovies, and some other things in there um, that can start to impede uh, the flavor of your drink. Someone asked about the white rum. Um, this is called Probitas. It's fairly new to Massachusetts. It's been here for um, a year or so, maybe, uh, from a really great um, distillery called Foursquare in Barbados, blended with a little Jamaican rum. Um, complex flavors achievable with alcohol, but with significantly less alcohol. Yeah. One really great way to go is sherry. Sherry wine is a fortified wine from Spain. Um, it is definitely, I would say, like an, an acquired taste for some and um, is uh, a really beautiful way to add a lot of flavor to cocktails while that product is only 16 to 19 percent ABV versus 40 plus. Um, so um, that's, that's a really great way to go. Um, any recommended books on cocktail making? Yes, I have many books. Um, I, uh, there, there's a Japanese term that I, I'm not, I, I, I can't remember off the top of my head, but it's like a, a person who buys books and just never reads them. Um, that's pretty much what I do. I buy these books, I flip through them. They're all interesting and really beautiful. Um, if I may, if you, wanna, if you wanna spend some money, this one is called Meehan's Bartender's Manual. It's a bar called PDT in New York. Um, this is based on that. It is just chock full of really interesting information and a lot of great recipes. There is um, 
rather tempted to put a big thing. This is one of the first books that I ever had called Vintage Spirits and Forgotten Cocktails. Um, this was a nice book because it actually opens and folds flat. This is all really old classic drinks and a lot of information um, about them. Uh, it's a really, really great way to go as well. But there's so many different books now. You've got so much, um, so many options now. So whether it's being very specific to a particular spirit um, or, um, or just generally about cocktails from particular places, um, you've got you got lots and lots of options, right? Um, let's see. Someone, <laughs> someone said they make caipirinhas by uh, crushing limes directly into the glass itself. Yeah, and you think about it, if you're squeezing the lime with like a muddler in the, the drink glass, you're pressing some of those oils out into the, the, the cocktail as well, plus just a bit of that bitterness from the pith, and that'll change the, the way the drink tastes. And if you want to try it, you know, make a caipirinha your way, and then make one with just fresh lime juice, and, 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 and no muddling, and you'll, you'll see they taste completely different, which is pretty cool. Um, so, yeah, uh, and then let's see, last one. Uh, are there any recommendations for cocktails that use fresh squeezed OJ? OJ is tough. Um, if you think about like acidic citrus juices, um, lemon and lime, high amount of acid, not that much sweetness. Lemons are, have a little bit more like kind of sugar content than, than limes do. Um, grapefruits are less acidic, but still much more acidic than they are sweet. And oranges are like pretty well balanced on their own, um, like which is why we enjoy drinking orange juice, um, and we don't enjoy drinking lemon juice. Um, I hope. Um, so, orange juice in cocktails is tough because it doesn't really add anything to a drink except for um, an orange flavor. Uh, which is actually fairly subtle when you start mixing it with other ingredients, or um, it'll add more volume, which is essentially diluting the flavor of the other ingredients that you're adding to that drink. So a lot of these um, orange um, drinks uh, tend to fall a little flat, um, is what we feel, and so we don't reach for it as often. Um, if you're thinking about like super classic drinks, um, there's one called a blood and sand, um, which is scotch, uh, a, uh, a product called uh, Cherry Hearing um, Sweet Vermouth and Orange Juice. It's a very odd combination, but it actually does work. Um, and what I've seen a lot of bars doing now is actually taking their orange juice and they're adding additional citric acid to it. And they're making uh, what they call acidified orange juice, um, which plays much better in, in cocktails. And so there are some modern drinks coming out now that use that that are um, pretty um, in interesting so um, I think that's what I got um, yeah and citric acid is like it's like fairly inexpensive and it lasts forever it's great um, so thank you sundoku is the term I was thinking of that's correct that is a hundred percent me but I just love books like they're just they're nice you know um, but sometimes it's cumbersome to flip through so I'll turn it over to Alyssa I know there are a few other questions there I'm sorry um, you can get in touch with me, uh, find me on Instagram at jared.sedoyan because I'm not clever and can't come up with anything um, outside of these, 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 these drinks. Um, and feel free to ping me um, if you've uh, got any questions or uh, are looking to make something cool at home. But thank you all for joining. This is, a re this is really cool. Alyssa? Thank you so much, Jared. I think we all learned a lot tonight and had a lot of fun. Uh, and thank you to everyone for tuning in. We're gonna be sending along to your inbox in just a few minutes a survey, so please send us your thoughts. Uh, the MIT 10 committee is continuously looking to bring ways to bring fun events like these to you while you're at home uh, and when we're all back in person. So thank you so much for tuning in uh, and uh, please share your thoughts. Stay safe and we'll see you all soon. Cheers friends, thank you. Thanks for joining us. And for more information on how to connect with the MIT Alumni Association, please visit our website.